Rabbi Mervis, it's really a privilege. Thank you so much for joining us. Vakashan. Thank you very much, Rabbi Graf, for your very warm and lovely words of welcome. You should call our Rabbanim and your Mechanchim. Such a great pleasure for me to be here today and to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. My theme is going to be Jewish pride. In the Gemara Masechet Sukkah of Lamed Hay, we are told that in ancient times, in Yerushalayim, there was a specific minhag during the week of Sukkot. Wherever a person would go, lulavo beyado, he would carry his lulav in his hand. When he went to visit friends, lulavo beyado. When he went to visit somebody who was sick, lulavo beyado. When he came to comfort somebody in distress, lulavo beyado. And the question that I want to ask is, why Dafka, this minhag for the festival of Sukkot? Why for Rosh Hashanah do we not have a minhag? Shofar Rabbi Let's take the shofar wherever we go. Or on Purim, Megillah Biyado. Why Dafka during Sukkot was there this minhag? And I think that the answer must be that you can conceal a shofar and also a Megillah. But you can't hide a lulav. When you're carrying it in the street, it will always be noticed, it will always be seen. And therefore, the lulav is a symbol of our pride. Through the lulav we make a statement to the world. We're Jewish and we're proud of it. And that's actually the primary theme of the entire festival of Sukkot. Because Sukkah is a mitzvah which cannot be hidden. If you would try to have an underground sukkah, away from the eyesight of anybody, by definition it would be pasul. The sukkah has to be open to the elements. And therefore throughout that festival, we're announcing to the world, look at what we're doing. It's different from you. We're proud of our differences. We're proud of our tradition. Whether you understand or appreciate it or not, this is what we are about. We have the enormous zuchut to practice the laws of the Torah Kedat the Kedin. When Yaakov Avinu was just about to pass away, he summoned his grandchildren Ephraim and Menashe, born to Yosef and Osnat in Egypt, and he gave them a bracha, and through them he wanted to convey a bracha to all of Klal Israel throughout all generations. He wanted to give us some inspiration to provide us with the capacity to survive against the odds. And the ikar of the bracha of Yaakov Avinu was the words, the yitgu larov, may you multiply like fish bekerev aretz in the midst of the world. Yaakov Avinu was saying to us, in order to have that capacity to survive, we, Am Yisrael, need to be like fish. What exactly did he mean? There's a Midrash which teaches as follows. With regard to animals, there are two simanei kashrut. One which is visible, cloven hooves. The other which is hidden, which is chewing the cud. You see one, the other you don't. With regard to fish, there are also two simanim but both are visible, fins and scales. The fish therefore declares its identity to the world. It's not shy about it. It doesn't hide anything away. A kosher fish declares, look at my fins and scales. I'm proud to be kosher. Similarly, Yaakov Avinu wanted to convey to us that as Jewish people through the ages, we should pronounce our Jewishness, not hide it, and we should be proud of it. At Mincha time on Yom Kippur, we read how Yonah Navi was on the run from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And when he was discovered by the captain of that boat, 
At a time of great peril and danger for everybody on board, the captain posed four strangers to four questions to the stranger. Where are you coming from? Where are you going to? What do you do? What nation are you part of? He wanted to know who this person was who was causing the storm. Yonah answered by saying, Ivri Anochi. I'm a Hebrew. I'm Jewish. And I'm proud of it. The essence of my character, of my personality, my very being, if you want to know where I'm coming from, where I'm going to, what nation I'm part of, what I do, Ivri Anochi. That's the essence of who I am and what I am about. I'm Jewish and I'm proud of, proud of it. I learned this lesson in a very profound way when I was 11 years old. So I was born in Johannesburg in South Africa. Anybody here got any South African connections? Great, okay, good, all right. So I was born in Johannesburg. Then, when I was five years old, my father became the rabbi of a city 20 miles outside of Johannesburg called Benoni. Benoni is well known in South Africa because in Benoni there is the world's largest gold mine. And therefore, Benoni over the years has had a strong Jewish community. My father established a Jewish school in Benoni called the Hillel School. However, when we first came, there was no Jewish school, and so I went to a non-Jewish primary school. And at that time, there was a football team, I think you called it soccer here, right? Yeah. Soccer team, called Benoni United. And Benoni United was doing really well. And when I was 11, Benoni United was promoted to the Premier League of Soccer in South Africa. All of Benoni went absolutely crazy. By the way, you know the name Benoni is Benoni, Binyamin. That was the name that Rachel Imenu gave to Binyamin, and then Yaakov changed it. It was established by some very religious Afrikaners in South Africa. That's the background of the city. So in the, in the midst of this soccer frenzy, something special happened to me. I was selected to play for my school team the Benoni West Primary School football team. Big yes. Thank you very much. It was the night before the very first game of the season. And I said to my parents, tomorrow I'm not going to school. I don't want to go through it. They said, what are you talking about? This is your big day. You've been selected to play for the team. We're going to come and watch you. It's going to be fantastic. I said, I'm not worried about the game. I'm worried about what's going to happen before the game. They said, what do you mean? What's going to happen before the game? I said, we're going to go into the changing room, and I'll take off my shirt, and everybody will see my tzitzit, and they're going to laugh. So I said to my parents, please, will you give, a, give me permission just for this one day not to wear my tzitzit? No way, said my parents. Of course you'll wear your tzitzit. And you'll see if any, first of all, nobody will notice. And if they do notice, you'll see. They will respect you for respecting your faith. Those words didn't mean anything to me. I had a very troubled night. I got up the next morning. I had to go to school. I had no choice. Everybody was really excited, looking forward to the match after school that day. I was dreading it. The bus came and took us to the ground. We came into the changing room. It was a square room, so there was nowhere where I could hide, but I went into one corner, I started to change, I took off my short shirt, and then it happened. One of the boys shouted out, and he said, Hey, look what he's got! And they all came round, and they made a circle around me. And then somebody came up, and he took hold of the tzitzit, and he said, Wow, isn't it amazing? He's wearing some lucky strings for the match. Everybody said, oh, brilliant. So they all came and shook the lucky strings. We went out to play the game. We won 2-0. Baruch Hashem, I scored both the goals. And after that match,
that. You see, most of the boys were not Jewish, but some were Jewish, but quite distant from Frumkite. After that first game, before every single match, all my friends came to check up that I was wearing my lucky strings. And I must tell you, they worked so well for me then, I wear them to this day. And I discovered that profound lesson at that tender age. Don't hide your Jewishness. Don't hide your tradition. Don't be shy or embarrassed about anything relating to the incredible and glorious tradition that we have received, starting with Avram Avinu and Sarah Imenu and going through the ages. And if there is a lesson that indeed I have learnt in life, it's the fact that people do respect those who respect their religion. And the more we display our Yiddishkeit and our Frumkeit with pride and follow an ethical and moral way of life, the greater is the Kiddush Hashem that we achieve. So therefore my request to you is, please be proud of your tradition. Be proud of this incredible school which has such a great reputation. Be proud of Tnuat B'nai Akiva which has over many years performed so many <coughs> incredible achievements around the world. And I was delighted as a child to be part of Tnuat B'nai Akiva and to grow up within the Tnuat and I recognize its significant achievements worldwide. Be proud of Medinat Yisrael. We're going through a very challenging time worldwide. Israel is unnecessarily criticized. Tzaha, which is a beacon of outstanding conduct, going to the nth degree to be concerned with sensitivity about innocent civilians on the enemy side, is castigated and denounced by the world. And just two weeks ago, UNESCO, on behalf of the United Nations, in a resolution declared that there is no historic connection between Am Yisrael and the Har Habayit. And we know that Yerushalayim Ir HaKodesh is the eternal capital of Am Yisrael. I wonder if you've ever thought about the selection of Yerushalayim as a capital city. Many countries have a hang-up about Yerushalayim being the capital city. And they situate their embassies in Tel Aviv instead. What's the problem with Yerushalayim from their point of view? Well, you know, Yerushalayim is a unique capital city. Because in order to choose a capital city, first of all, it needs to be an accessible place, easy for people to get to. There needs to be a natural supply of water. Therefore, most capitals are either on a major river or by the shore. But Yerushalayim doesn't tick any of those boxes. It's never been easily accessible. It's up in the mountains. In ancient times, the way of the sea went from Egypt up to Lebanon. The King's Highway went from Saudi Arabia of today up to Damascus. You would only get to Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh, if you fablonzed, if you lost your way. And beyond that, there is no natural water supply in Yerushalayim. Who would ever think of establishing a capital city? There's no river, no natural water supply. Try and perform Tashlich on Rosh Hashanah in Yerushalayim. You've got a huge challenge. There are some who stand on Harat Sofim or Harat Zitim, from which they presume they can see the Dead Sea. Or there are some wells in the Shari Chesed area. There's no natural water. So why was Yerushalayim chosen? The Pasuk says, Ki vachar Hashem betzion, Hashem chose Zion as the place for His habitation. Yerushalayim has spiritual properties the type of which no other place on earth has. That's why it was chosen as our capital city. And from the moment it was chosen, there has been an enormous amount of jealousy. And you know, there are a few words in Hebrew which have no singular. For example, water. One tiny drop of water is mine. It's in the plural. Because you look out to the oceans and the water seems to be never-ending. So too with the heavens. One tiny little piece of the sky is Shamaim. There's no singular. Shamaim is Shamaim. There there are waters. The waters above. So too with life. A nanosecond of life is Chaim. 
there is no singular. And that is because life is never ending. When chas v'shalom, physical life, ends in this world, the neshama continues to exist. And Yerushalayim, likewise, is a city that is in the plural, because it's the birat hanetzach of Am Yisrael. It always has been and always will be our capital city. And even though there have been those who have attacked Jerusalem, who have destroyed Yerushalayim, who have declared it to be null and void, Nonetheless, with Siyadah Dishmai, it has continued to be the center of our Jewish consciousness, the heart of our world. It's always ours, continuously. And this is something which some nations of the world are uncomfortable about. But for us, our Zionism, our Medinat Israel, is of crucial importance to us. And therefore be proud of Medinat Israel, regardless of what sometimes you might read in the newspapers or when you go to university, what you might hear on some campuses. Because the truth is that Medinat Israel is the most incredible country, that one that we're proud to declare to be ours, one where we're proud to be able to learn and hopefully to live one day. So therefore, please be proud. I learned this lesson when I was 11. Don't wait till it's too late to reflect with pride on your families, on your tradition, on how fortunate you are to be part of the great people of Am Yisrael. And please always reflect that pride in order to have a positive impact, not only on Klal Yisrael, but on the whole world as well. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you again, Rabbi Mervis. Uh, I should mention as well that uh, Rabbi Mervis will be speaking uh, this evening uh, at Shari Shemayim.